Well, as we continue to look at the conversion of the Apostle Paul, known as Saul in our text, uh, we pick up there this morning in Acts chapter 9. And we're going to start there at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. I'll praise the Lord. Magnify the precious name of Jesus, who reaches even the most defiled. And that's what Paul describes himself as. He calls himself the chief of all sinners. And as we gather here this morning, we continue to look behind the curtain, as it were, uh, the sovereign direction of God in salvation and how He uses different people with strategic encounters. And and as we see this unfolding in the the life of the Apostle Paul that we know here as Saul, uh, we know that uh, with regards to his salvation, it was ordained by God just as your salvation and my salvation have been ordained. Kent Hughes, he notes here that Saul, a fierce persecutor of the church of Christ, discovered first to his horror and then to his eternal delight that he, the hunter, was also the hunted. For all of us who are in Christ, The story in Acts 9 is a picture of how we came to be his. Saul, the hunter, was a brutal, implacable, bloody man. His goal was nothing short of the complete extermination of the way. And the way was believers who long before they were called Christians, they were called the way. Verse 1 of Acts 9 explains that Paul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Threatening and slaughter and come had threatening, threatening and slaughter had come to be the very breath that Saul breathed. Like a war horse who sniffed the smell of battle. He was a frightening, violent enemy of the church. He was a callous, self-righteous, bigoted murder set on a full-scale inquisition. Soon, Jerusalem could not hold him. He sought and received extradition papers from the Sanhedrin so he could go to Damascus and ravage the growing Christian community there as well. Yet this persecutor, by the grace of God, became an apostle of Jesus Christ. The story of Saul's spiritual transformation ought to remind us never to write anyone off as being beyond the love of Christ. We may do so with relatives whom we have uh, have hurt no 
We, we may do so with relatives whom we know have heard the word for years without response or a sinner who has gone to a crass level of depravity or someone who has gone into a cult or is propagating false doctrine. But Scripture is clear. God can reach anyone. And that's what we find that has happened here in Acts chapter 9. And our text this morning reveals that the salvation of every individual is the result of the divine intervention of God from start to finish. Luke documents how the sovereign conversion of Saul of Tarsus continues to unfold before us through the divine orchestration of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the hand of the Lord working providentially here in three distinct ways. First, through a chosen or through a certain disciple. And that disciple in Damascus, his name is Ananias. Secondly, through a chosen instrument. And that's how the Apostle Paul is described by God to Ananias, who is gravely concerned about even connecting with this person that he had heard was coming to destroy the church. So we have a certain disciple, a chosen instrument, and then finally, a strategic encounter. And we just see this over and over and over again. And we'll see this throughout the book of Acts. We saw it with Stephen in, in terms of, of his work uh, with the Hellenistic Jews. Uh, we see it with Philip as he was sent to Samaria and then strategically placed uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch. And now we find Ananias being dispatched. And he is dispatched for the purpose of coming alongside Saul as his brother in the faith. And so a certain disciple, a chosen instrument, and a strategic encounter. We begin there with the certain disciple, and his name is Ananias. And it says there in verse 10, now there was a disciple, and in some translations actually says there was a certain disciple disciple. This is not just any disciple. This is a specifically set apart disciple. He's got this responsibility and the, the, the one who gave him this responsibility was God. Now a certain disciple at Dana Damascus named Ananias and Paul speaks about him in his, in his testimonies. We see for instance in Acts 22 verse 12, a certain Ananias a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. As he's sharing his testimony, he reveals his encounter with this man, how God brought this man into his life. And I want you to think of that. I want you to think of how God has brought your life into the lives of others around you. This is how God has chosen to work. He does not pull his disciples into the kingdom immediately upon conversion. He leaves us. It's, it's exactly what Jesus talked about in uh, John chapter 17 in his high priestly prayer. Um, he, he was not asking the Father to take his disciples out of the world, but that he would keep them. Keep them. And not, not just keep them here, but keep them. In other words, hold them fast as they're walking through this world, because he knew what was coming. He knew the challenges. And that's, we see some of that trepidation with Ananias here. It's like, okay, Lord, I just, I think we need to have a little chat here. I just want to remind you of a few things that I've heard. And I tell you what, we hear a lot. We hear a lot about what's going on around the world. And we've got brothers and sisters in the faith who have been called certain disciples to go to foreign countries and to lands that are very difficult to go into to share the hope of the gospel. It, it can be very life-threatening for them to do such a thing. And yet the Lord, by His grace, He keeps His disciples in place. And it may be for a short time, but then again it might be for a lifetime. But this is Ananias, and he is a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And just to clarify, a disciple of Christ is a believer is a follower of Jesus Christ. And the Lord, it says here, that the Lord said to him in a vision. And this is a connecting point here between 
Saul and Ananias because not only is Ananias receiving this vision, but Saul is receiving this vision. And so he says, as he spoke to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And it, it's very Samuel-like. Remember when Samuel was a little boy, we went through the book of 1 Samuel um, in the last couple years and have come through 2 Samuel, about ready to wrap that particular book up. And, and we find that he has been uh, placed with Eli. This was a promised child. Uh, as, as we see a mom praying and crying out to God, as she's barren, and she pledges this child to the Lord's service. And God opens her womb, and she gives birth to Samuel, and and she takes him to Eli, the the priest uh, at that time. And and as he's with him, we find that um, Samuel is laying down in the place near where the Ark of the Covenant was, and it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9, that uh, this follows uh, this um, voice that is resounding. And as Samuel hears uh, his name being spoken, and he keeps going to Eli. I didn't say anything to you. And the second time, I, I didn't say, you go back to bed. Go back and lie down and go to sleep. But, you know, he began to realize that something is happening here, and he says um, in verse 9, Eli says to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That's 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at, at the other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. This is exactly what Ananias is doing right here. He is hearing the Lord speak his name. And he just simply says, here I am, Lord. In other words, whatever you want, Lord. I, I am your servant, Lord. And I want you to know that Ananias' ear was tuned to the voice of the Lord Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 10 that he was the good shepherd. And one of the things that he describes about being the good shepherd is that his sheep know his voice. Verse 4 of John 10, when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. I've shared this before many times, and it's not a story unfamiliar to you in your own life and childhood. You could be four blocks away from your house, and you could hear the distinct but distant sound of your mama calling your name. And I, that happened many times. And we knew if mom was calling our name, she told us, you need to get home. You know, if you hear me calling, um, you need to get home. We're familiar. We're familiar with that voice. A mama's voice with their baby is, is soothing, is steadying, as we think about that here on Mother's Day. And he, here we have the good shepherd who speaks. And I, I would ask, you know, how does the Lord speak to us today? Well, we are so blessed that he has spoken to us through his word. Of course, the Lord is described, Jesus is described as the word become flesh. And, and you know how God spoke in prophets and, and the law in many ways in, in, in the past. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. And in salvation and in fellowship with the Lord. When you hear me read these scriptures this morning, you're hearing the Lord speak. It is His voice. And it's unique with regards to the, the role of the shepherd among His sheep who hear His voice. He's called them by name. And Jesus goes on to describe what is a distinguishing 
reality between those who are not the sheep of, of the Lord and those who are. We see it in verse 24 of John 10. That the Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you. He told them plainly. And yet, you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify about me. In other words, not only have I told you, but the works, the signs, the wonders that I have done in my Father's name, they legitimize, they authenticate this. But then he goes on to clarify in verse 26. But you do not believe me because you are not of my sheep. And then he, he clarifies with regards to whose sheep are. In verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I want you to know in terms of knowing, it's just like, a, it's not like a, I know about that person. I've heard about that person. No, this is an intimate knowledge. This is a knowledge of communion and fellowship and relationship. And that's what we see here with Ananias. He has heard the shepherd's voice. So what distinguishes those who believe and those who do not believe in Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus states that those who believe in him hear his voice. Alistair Begg notes here that Ananias was unmistakably and clearly aware of what was going on. His ear was so tuned to the voice of God. Is your ear tuned to the voice of God? Do you hear God speak to you through his word? Does he speak in that unmistakable, still, small voice saying, as the word is opened up and as people share it, that's true, that's true for you? Take hold of that, eat that, this is my word for you. This is a mark of true discipleship. This is the mark of those who are walking in the pathway of Jesus. What did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. I call them by their names, and they follow me. Oh, to preach to the congregations who come to worship of God, the, the worship of God on the Lord's day, with that as their theme. Not this scrambling, jambling horde of people talking about where they're going to lunch or how they bought a new caravan and, and what happened to their grandchildren or who will know what who who knows what'll happen the next general election and oh wait a minute I think I just heard the buzzer going. Here would be the the tone going. I think it must be I think worship must be beginning. No, no. People who are coming into the Word of God saying, speak, because I'm listening. Not coming for entertainment, not coming to give points out of ten for whether the guy's funny or long or short or good or no good, but coming because they want God to speak. That's discipleship, brothers and sisters. That's Ananias. He had an ear that was open to the voice of God. And God gives us such ears. And so those who hear Jesus' voice contrast themselves with those who don't. Who don't love the Word of God. Who don't read the Word of God. Who don't sit under the teaching of God's Word. But certainly we find that that's not the case with Ananias. Here I am, Lord. And it says here that the Lord sovereignly chose to send Ananias to Saul. Uh, of all the people that is going to go and get this job done, Barnabas is on the scene. He could have used Barnabas for this very moment, but yet he's determined that Barnabas is going to do something else later. He's going to take him before the apostles and be that bridge 
to reveal what God has done in Paul's life. No, God has chosen this certain disciple. And there are many who, who believe, don't have the official record of this, but the fact that he was such a prominent figure and spoken of here in this context that, that he may have been the leader of the church or in leadership of the church in Damascus among the fellow believers. But we don't have those details. We, we just have this one mention of Ananias in terms of, of this particular historic record. And then it's repeated in Paul's testimony uh, as we find later on in the book of Acts. But we see there that Ananias must get up and go to the street called Straight. And there is a, a, a street called Straight to this very day in that region of Damascus that goes from one end to the other. Well, we don't know. There's some, again, you go to, to the Holy Lands and, and there are certain people say, well, this is where this went down right here. This is the house or that's the cave or that's the tomb or whatever. We, we don't really, we, we can't really know for sure but what we do have here is a historic record for us. That this happened on the street called Straight, and he was to inquire at the house of Judas. And this is really what pinned his ears back at this moment when he said, I want you to inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Probably just... All the air just went out of his body as he heard that name. And he says that in verse 9 or verse 6, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. This is what Paul heard from the Lord in terms of his confrontation with his encounter with the Lord. There it will be told to him, what he must do. So who's going to tell him what he's supposed to do? Ananias. And so we, we find, and I, I talked about this last week with regards to Saul, we, we see the evidence of his conversion. In this very moment is his obedience when it, it says Saul got up from the ground. And then Though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. He, he, he took his associates that were going with him to destroy the church and, and to take out these believers and bring them back arrested and bound for trial. Um, he asked these men, I, gotta, I still got to get into D Damascus. We, we see the obedience of, of Saul as a man of faith in this moment, and we see the reality of the obedience of, of Ananias, that he was going to get up and go. He, he was going to go, but he has this conversation that he's going to have. So we, we see here, you know, he's, he's to go and inquire uh, of a, for a man from Tarsus named uh, Saul, and we find also in verse 11 that he is praying. And I, I tag this as evidence of his conversion. Because that's what every believer does. Is they pray. MacArthur rightly observes here that Saul used to pray the prayers of a Pharisee. He used to pray the legalistic prayers of one who thought he was righteous in his own way and on his own merit. Now he prays in blind and literally physical. He's physically blind. He, now he prays in blind, helpless dependency. He's trying to sort out what just happened to him. The fire breather has lost his fury. Three days of prayer. This indicates a real transformation. The transformed life is the life that cries out to God from day one. For the Christian, prayer is the breath of the new life. Prayer is simply the soul of a Christian moving under the pressure of the presence of God. Prayer is the most natural thing, the most inevitable thing, the most immediate thing. He cries out to his new Lord. Everything in his life has changed. Everything else that he once knew 
the, everything else that he once knew is now, he says in Philippians 3, dung, manure. Everything he once hoped in, everything he put his trust in, everything he worked for, everything he sought for, all religious attainments, all spiritual accolades were dung. He's crying out for everything he needs because everything he had is gone. It's worthless. He is stripped naked. As Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3, I count them all but lost. For three days, he's crying out to his new Lord. He has no other person to turn to, and so he prays. And prayer is not a one-sided conversation, and Paul learns it very fast because Ananias is given a corresponding vision, and Paul is told that. He's, He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight so Ananias knows to go see Paul. Paul knows Ananias is coming, even though Paul is blind. I just remind you how great God is. This is an indication that he is in absolute and total control of the thoughts and minds of a man. He is directing each of these men, and he is bringing them together. This is the work of God. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that when you have that person on your mind or that coworker that you're sharing with, not to be intimidated by that, not to be fearful because the Lord is with you. And as God is working in your life to share that hope of Christ with someone, believe me, God is working in that person's life. We see it here. He is using Ananias. He's using Saul. He has given them corresponding visions. I mean, all these things is orchestrated by God. So I just want you to see that in terms of how you go about your daily routine of coming in and and you have this, uh, you know, unexpected encounter that you've been praying God would put somebody in your path and somebody's in your path. Know that God is working just as much in you as he's working in them. So, church, we must be a people who devotes ourselves to Christ in prayer. And that's exactly where we began at the early church, the very first church, the first 3,000 people that were added to their number. Uh, Before that, they were in the upper room and they were praying in Acts chapter 1, waiting for the Spirit to arrive. The Spirit comes. Uh, the, The message of the gospel is proclaimed. People come to faith in Christ, and then those people who came faith in faith in Christ, what were they devoting themselves to? They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You don't have to teach a baby to cry. And mama's a whole lot better than daddy's. Know those cries. There's certain ways that they cry and that mom distinguishes and that's a hungry cry or that's, that's a hurt kind of cry or what have you. And dads are always like, hey, the baby's crying. Somebody, somebody come and get the baby. They're crying. Prayer. It's just simply crying out to God. And what a gift that God has given us. And the great high priest, our our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he is our mediator, mediating on our behalf between us and the throne of grace. So Saul himself, as we see in the text, and again, this is an encouraging word to, to Ananias. Hey, Ananias, I want you to go to Judas's house. And I want you to lay hands on Saul of Tarsus. Ooh. Let me just tell you a little bit about him right now. He's praying. He has received the same vision. A vision that a man by the name of Ananias come in. Huh, well, that that happens to be my name. I'm Ananias. God's orchestrating. He's seen this. He's expecting you. He has seen in this vision Ananias is going to come into the house. 
and he's going to lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And remember, in verse 8, Saul had lost his sight. When he had the vision, when he was confronted with Christ on the road to Damascus, he got up, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And Paul says in Acts 22, verse 11 of this, but I, since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Now, there are some in terms of commentary and b b biblical study that interpret this blindness, this short-term blindness of, of Paul to help him recognize that, you know, what you thought was sight and, and Phariseeism and your learned years and the, the law and these kinds of things. You've actually been spiritually blind all this time. So I'm going to make you physically blind so that you can see spiritually. And this was only a three-day occurrence in his life. It's interesting that Jesus was in the tomb for three days. We just see correlation. And so, in terms of this encounter that now Ananias is having with the Lord in this vision, you know, An Ananias is answering the Lord. He has a few concerns, and this is where we find out that the certain disciple is about ready to come into contact with a chosen instrument. Who is, that's how Paul is described. It's, it's further affirmation for Ananias is, that this is my chosen instrument. And we see there in, in verse 13 that Ananias answered the Lord with some concerns about this man's reputation. He says, Lord, I've heard many things from many about this. I've heard, thing, heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And I want you to know that the Lord is not, he's not put off by this. Because, you know, when you and I talk to the Lord, we're not telling him anything he doesn't already know. And so he's just laying this out there. He says, not only he has done much harm to your saints in Jerusalem, but here, here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. I just happen to be one of those. He doesn't say that, but I mean, he's one of those. Now, Saul was confronted. He was confronted with his sin of persecuting Jesus. When, when he's talking about the harm that he has committed in Jerusalem, the fact that he's coming to bind believers here in Damascus, that is what Jesus called out as the sin of persecuting me, Jesus said. Why are you, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I find it interesting that the, the concerns that this man has it is the very sin that Jesus or that Saul committed against Christ himself. And certainly in the con context of his church. And we noted last week that, that with regards to this, that every, every person who comes to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, one of the very first things they're confronted with is their sin. And that's what the Holy Spirit as we noted, when, when Jesus promised in John 16, 7 to send the Holy Spirit, and then verse 8, uh, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment and concerning sin at the heart of our sin because they do not believe in me. At the heart of every person's sin is the rejection of God. The rejection of His Son, Jesus. And I appreciate this as a part of the ongoing journey here unfolding in terms of the life of Paul. And, and this is what Jesus has confronted Saul with. 
You know, this is what Ananias has heard. This is what this man has done, the harm to the church, and he's coming to harm our church here locally. And so the Lord reveals to Ananias, the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. He's not the only chosen instrument. He says, go. And what I mean by that, what I think he means by that, when I hear that word go, do not fear. Do not hesitate. Go immediately. Why? For he is a chosen instrument of mine, which again is another mark of the evidence of his conversion. That in, in the, the calling of of Saul to repentance, to confront him with sin, his sin in terms of conversion, and in the immediacy of that, that he is calling to be an instrument of God. It's, it's all simultaneously, all interconnected. And that is our story, brothers and sisters. You need to go because he is ekloge, chosen. It's what we get our word election from, from the Greek. And it means a divine selection, a choosing out. It is a choice by God, an electing choice. And God, as we read from Galatians chapter 1 at the beginning of our worship this morning, but when God, verse 15, Galatians 1, who had set me apart, Paul is giving his testimony has set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through His grace. He is talking about how even before His birth, He was chosen of God, not only for salvation, but as His instrument to share the gospel of salvation. Paul was an apostle of Christ Jesus, he told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, as he, he reveals himself in the opening part of the letter, an apostle of Christ Jesus according to the commandment of God our Savior. And a commandment is an order. Orders are what are to be followed. They, they are not to... You know, you know, if you're under the command in the military, you, you don't choose what your orders are. You have superiors and commanding officers who do that. And that's the essence of what we need to understand here, that, that you know, Ananias and Saul are under the command of the Creator God and the command of our Savior and our Lord and our King, Jesus Christ. Paul would, would share that in, in terms of, of his own personal ministry. There was not something that he came up with. That he didn't parlay uh, his, his newfound faith into a living that he decided to do. He says in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God. He, he starts about, hey, this is my gospel, but it's not my gospel. It's the gospel that I have been given. And where did it come from? It was the commandment of God. This, this revelation, uh, this mystery that I now understand that I'm proclaiming, it came by commandment of the eternal God. And he has been, has been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith. And that's what, you know, an order is. Obey my commands. And Jesus even says of his disciples, if you love me, you will keep, you will obey my commands. So here is the chosen instrument. And again, further strengthening and encouragement for Ananias because he knows what it means to be a chosen instrument. 
Because at this very moment, for him to go and to lay hands on the Apostle Paul is to be a chosen instrument. So Paul was an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, by the will of God, by the election of God. And then he goes on to say, and this has got to just be joyously ringing in his ears. He will bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. We have another, another instrument for the gospel among us. A Peter and a James and a Paul and a Philip and a Stephen. And now a Saul. But then he goes on to say that I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul, he would suffer greatly. I mean, again, as, as he talks about that later in 2 Corinthians, because they, they thought it was foolish because he was under persecution, and, and they saw that as, as connected to sin. You must be doing something against God, and that's why all this is happening to you. They, it's kind of like yin and yang. Oh, you're doing something bad, so you're getting this. But no, this was in his calling. He was chosen instrument that would suffer greatly for sharing the gospel. And just highlight this from 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? He's distinguishing himself uh, among false apostles. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, because it's going to be insane that he's accounting uh, the, the suffering that he has undergone in his service. Because they're saying he, he's not a true apostle. Look at all the bad stuff that's happening to him. He says, I more so, it, 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 he says, are, you, are they servants of Christ? I, I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city. Dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and, and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of the concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. So what Ananias is told about the Apostle Paul comes to, to life. This entire remaining balance of the years of his life, however many of the years that was, could have been 30, 40 years. And it would end in martyrdom. We find that Paul was dragged. One of the stonings, he was stoned there. He came from Antioch and Iconium in Acts chapter 14, verse 19. And having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. So what do you do after you get stoned and you, you can't hardly move and you, they think you're dead and they drag you out to the, like to the, the trash heap outside the city gate? While the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derb. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, and here it is, brothers and sisters, suffering is not the, the path only for Saul. He says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 
And so we will suffer. Dr. York was sharing, uh, he's from Southern Seminaries, biblical preaching and dean of the School of Theology as the school that I did my doctoral studies in. He shared about his dad. His dad, when, when Dr. York was three years of age, his dad had, uh, was fulfilling a, a lifelong desire for, for ministry and to go to the mission field. And, and so he went uh, you know, to Brazil, I believe, into the Amazonian, Amazonian-type jungle area and region. And he, he talked about, you know, uh, how God just in powerful ways worked in his dad's life that six weeks in country having little to no um, language skill whatsoever by by the end of six weeks he was already preaching and in the native tongue the gospel and he was there for a year and a half and during that time period he, he got you know whatever it was parasites or you name it it just began to ravage his body so much so that he had to come back to the states and he was just prayerful. You're praying to the Lord that the Lord would just heal his body and clear these parasites and, and you know, just, you know, correct the, 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 the damage that they had done and, and so that he could get back to the mission field. But that was not going to be his journey. He was only there for just like less than a year and a half. And the ravages of, of that illness that he underwent, uh, it just, just, just destroyed his digestive tract and his, um, you know, he became incontinent and, and, and just could not control. And there was just no way for him to go back on the field in those type of circumstances. And it was devastating to his dad. And yet he leaned into the grace of God. To Paul, he, he talks about himself in 2 Corinthians 10 when he had his thorn in the flesh. And the Lord did not remove that. Brothers and sisters, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That even in sharing the, sharing the gospel, we may very well be rejected or ridiculed or even arrested. There was a young student at, at a school. He just had like uh, five words um, on a T-shirt that said, um, there are only two genders. And he, he was pulled out by a teacher and, and principals, and they talked to him about that and how that's offensive with so many different people and, and that he's going to have to take off that shirt. And he said, I don't want to take off the shirt because they are part of my core beliefs. E even our own children are going to face those kinds of challenges when they stand up and say, this is what the Bible says. Thus saith the Bible, thus saith the word of God. And so we see here, you know, in terms of the clear, <laughs> divine and sovereign calling of this man for ministry. John Piper recognizes that the divine election of Saul and his salvation and call to service when he writes, Jesus has chosen Paul long before Paul chose Jesus. In fact, Paul says so in Galatians 1.15, that God had set him apart before he was born. And, and since he is chosen by Jesus, Jesus does not speak as though Paul might not go along with it. He will. So Jesus speaks of the great ministry Paul is going to have with kings and nations in Israel. And it speaks of how much he must suffer, not might suffer. So it is clear that this conversion is a, is a work of divine, sovereign grace, just as it is in your life and my life, brothers and sisters. How do I know this? Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he that is God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them so this is not unique to Paul this is unique to God in the call of every believer we just see it here we see the curtain pulled back and we see how God is working in the life of Ananias and how God is working in the life of his new convert, Saul, and how he's 
now going to bring them together in a strategic encounter. And here we see the obedience of a sheep, of the shepherd, who speaks to the Lord. Here's his concerns laid out there, and yet encouraged with the truth of the Lord. This is how I'm working in his life. This, he is my chosen instrument. And what do we find in verse 17? So Ananias departed. And he entered the house. He went straight to the straight street, to the house of Judas. And he says that he walked in and laid hands on Saul. And then we recognize that, that Ananias refers to Saul as his brother. How do we know that? He says, Brother Saul. And Ananias affirms Jesus' appearance before Saul. He says, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming. And God had pointed Saul to know his will and see the righteous one, Paul says in, in Acts twenty two fourteen. In verse 15, you will be a witness for him to all men what you have seen and heard. That's, that's why God came. That's why the Lord Jesus came to Saul on the road. Ananias reveals why the Lord had sent him to Saul. He says, he has sent me so that you may regain your sight. And secondly, that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, evidence of his conversion. And still in the apostolic witness. We see this, remember? We, we've been watching this. That every time we see the outpouring of the Spirit, it's after the apostles have come, they're eyewitnesses to this. Eyewitnesses in Samaria. There aren't going to be eyewitness. Peter's eyewitness in the house of Cornelius. Well, what apostle is going to be eyewitness to the Spirit in Saul? Well, Saul is, along with Ananias, who's come to lay hands on him. And so we just see that apostolic witness here once again and how the Holy Spirit is, is coming. And so it says here that uh, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight. The Lord said this is what was going to happen and it happened. The Lord fulfills his word. We see in verse 12, he has seen a, a vision of a man named Ananias come in, lay on, hands on him that he might re regain his sight, and bam, confirmed. The word of the Lord is certain. Every word stands from Genesis to Revelation. And there are many denominations and religious agencies and organizations who are walking away from the truth of God's word. We're not, can't, because every last word is going to come to fruition. And the only way that people are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ is through His Word. The Lord fulfills His Word. We see it as He comes to Ananias, or He comes to, Ananias comes to Saul. He has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And his eyes were opened. And we, we can recognize that the Spirit had come because he got up and was baptized. And that's what every obedient child of faith does. That, in terms of confession of faith, the next is, is the affirmation before God's people to follow the Lord in the waters of baptism that's what Jesus in his commission said, go to the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. We find in terms of, of the appeal of Ananias in Acts chapter 22 the, that, that Saul says, uh, now why do you delay? Get up 
and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And so he got up and he was baptized. Saul is a believer. And he hadn't eaten for three days. Many believe uh, in the text with regards to prayer that he was fasting and praying. So at this point, he took food and was strengthened. And he's going to be strengthened further in the days ahead with men like Barnabas. But this is a radical conversion. This is the radical conversion and transformation of Saul of Tarsus. And it serves as an example to the world that God can save any individual. Piper states that the conversion of Paul was the conversion of an utterly committed opponent, opponent of Christianity. Luke really stresses this in Acts 8, 3. He says, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering the house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Then in Acts 9, 1 through 2, Luke says that Paul was not just threatening the Christians. He was breathing threats. It's as though persecution was the air he breathed. This was not a minor or peripheral thing in Paul's life. It went right to the core of who he was as a Pharisee. Christianity with its message of salvation by faith apart from the meritorious works would, be, would turn Paul's religious achievements into a pile of rubbish and be the end of all his boasting. So Paul was breathing threats and murder against Christians. He was even taking his persecution 150 miles north to Damascus and planning to bring Christians back to Jerusalem for punishment. This is the kind of person that no one expects to be converted. His opposition is too deep and too articulate. So much of his life would be threatened if Christianity were true. And he, had, he has taken such a public stand that it would be utterly humiliating to change his mind and support what he had fought. So what God wants us to see in this conversion is the most unlikely people can be converted and are converted. God's mercy and power are not limited to people who have been set up for Christianity by a good family or a church association or a clean moral track record. The chief of sinners was converted. And that means hope in evangelism and in your own faltering walk with the Lord. This means that we should not be despairing for those who show no signs of being prepared for conversion. It is a mistake to think that prayers for others are only effective if they have an immediate effect in some kind of openness or interest or spiritual sensitivity. Paul was not open and not interested and not spiritually sensitive. He was utterly closed and utterly convinced that Christianity was untrue. He was not ripe for the picking, as we like to say. He was way beyond the picking. He was hard and dry and shriveled up. What happened to Paul was sudden and utterly unexpected. And that means the same can happen for others. We should keep praying and keep speaking the truth in love. Paul's conversion was a work of divine sovereign grace. Jesus totally took over on the road to Damascus. It was utterly sovereign. That means it was utterly free and unmerited and that it came with, with overwhelming authority and power. Whatever resistance Paul might have been able to put up against this sovereign grace gave way before the triumphant love of God. Cannot stand before him. And when he changes you, you're changed. And that is salvation. And so, Father God, as we think about these events that you have set before us in your word, to show us your amazing handiwork in the lives of, of those that you are bringing to faith in Christ, in Christ alone. Like, oh, Father God, we just give you praise that we're not worthy of salvation. We are worthy of your wrath and your eternal judgment. And so, Lord, we gather on this Lord's day to praise you and to declare your glory. Who are we, O oh Lord? That you have chosen us in salvation and for your service.
How have we found favor that only by your grace, by your purposes in this world? So, Lord, may we take a moment now and think of those in our lives that need to know the Lord. Even those that we deem impossible. God, may we pray for them right now and lift them before your throne of grace. That you would begin that work in them. That you will be faithful to complete. Just take a moment, brothers and sisters, and lift up the name of a family member or a loved one or a neighbor, co-worker. Lift them before the throne of grace. That God's grace might be poured out upon them. Even now, even in this moment, even when we're praying that they would be utterly changed. Don't know what hit them until they recognize the very Lord who calls them to faith. Pray for them, brothers and sisters. Oh, Lord God, thank you for the gift of our time together today. Thank you for speaking so boldly through your word. Lead us, Father God, in your service as your instruments chosen. Knowing that you have set before us works of service that you prepare beforehand. May we be faithful. For your glory, it's the name of Christ I pray. Amen.